Development Organizations. Uh, in 2006, in October, we filed the permit um, and to, to reconsider the, 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 the permit, the petition to reconsider the permit. And um, I kind of want to go over why we did that. What is the basis? A lot of people wonder what's in this alcohol, you know, what's in the affluent. Um, it's, it's very hard to characterize that. As Carl mentioned, it's really easy to characterize um, how we measure its effects uh, on the environment, um, but it's a lot harder to, to kind of characterize each, each little thing. Um, but quite simply, uh, is what is the basis of the petition for us that we didn't think that it met Clean Water Act or state standards? Um, the full petition itself highlighted about 11 major areas of concerns that we had. Um, this included color, turbidity, aesthetic impacts, temperatures, things like anti-degradation reviews. These are things that I really don't want to get into because they're very complicated. I kind of boiled this down into five kind of major categories. Um, one was ecosystem impacts. Uh, at that time, um, and, and still today, it had been uh, since 1986, um, since any ecological monitoring had occurred within the ocean environment. 1986, I mean, don't get me wrong, 1986 was a great year. Huey Lewis was at the top of the record charts. <laughs> the Macintosh 2 came out with a really cool, fancy thing they called a mouse. Um, but to us, um, we really didn't feel like um, ocean monitoring and science, you know, it, it advanced a long way in 20 years, and the department shouldn't be relying on this uh, out-of-date science to inform their permit uh, decision making. Um, we were seeing, looking at pollutant loads as well, that we were concerned about. Um, we had mentioned, you know, a lot of folks had, had brought up uh, heavy metals, and, and one of the big ones that jumped out at us was lead. Um, when you're looking at the at lead itself on, on, a, on, on the dilution factor as it comes out, it seems like a small concentration. Um, but when you add that up, 11 million gallons a day over the course of a year, you're looking at somewhere between 1,700 and 1,900 pounds of lead entering the environment. Um, and so not knowing our near shore conditions very well at that time, using 20 year old science um, to try and uh, uh, to figure out how this stuff was interacting in our near shore was a big concern for us. Um, so another area that was uh, pretty big for us was bacteria. Um, at the time, uh, DEQ had granted basically variants within the uh, mixing zone uh, for bacteria. They did require Georgia Pacific to do a pretty extensive bacteria monitoring plan. They went up their pipe and basically tried to source where this bacteria was coming from, cultured it out. Um, the findings and, and stuff of that, I think, are debatable. Um, at the time, though, you know, we, what we were seeing were bacteria limits that were, you know, 10 times above what the health advisory uh, limit should be on that. And so that was a major concern for us. Dissolved oxygen. This is something that Jack did a really nice job of touching on and talking about um, how dynamic uh, the, the place is um, that we, uh, this near shore place where, where this mixing is happening. Um, but uh, over the course of 20 years, we've really learned a lot. And um, DAQ at the time had not really appropriately addressed seasonal variations that we now know about. Um, Jack did a really good job of explaining those. But, um, you know, we were seeing oxygen depleting nutrients coming out of the, of the mill's uh, effluent um, to the tune of about 6,800 pounds of nitrate, 7,800 pounds of ammonia uh, annually. Um, so that, that puts quite the biological demand um, on, on the ocean. And then the fluent itself was averaging somewhere around 1.02 milligrams per liter uh, um, in oxygen, which, uh, as, as Jack touched on before, that's, that's at the hypoxic level. Um, so we would characterize that as hypoxic. Um, mixing zones. We keep talking about this mixing zone. I don't know how many people know what a mixing zone is. Um, but philosophically, we just don't really agree with mixing zones. Um, for our organization, we don't believe that the solution to pollution is dilution. Um, mixing zones are a way of permitting um, discharges that can't meet water quality, water quality criteria at the end of the pipe. So you rely on ocean mixing um, or mixing in a river. This is where you see more, it's more common to actually see mixing zones in rivers. Um, but we, we rely on this ocean mixing to dilute um, the pollutant loads that, that are going into the water. Dilute these things like bacteria, dissolved oxygen, the trace metals, um, and things. Um, so at an average of like 11 million gallons a day, again, um, 
the mixing zone permit will still rely on, upon the Pacific Ocean, which is a finite resource, um, to dilute these pollutant loads indefinitely. So it, I, I can see the premise for how mixing zones may work and function in rivers, um, and, but ultimately we know the fate of our rivers is the ocean, um, and we also know that um, mixing zones in the ocean, they do the same thing. We're dumping into a finite resource, and when's the breaking point? Um, when is when is the uh, when is the time um, uh, appropriate for us to say, well, I think we may have hit the threshold here, um, and how do we know when we've gotten there? Um, so those are some of the major concerns. Another big area with the mixing zone that's um, kind of hard to see in this picture that is that what you see isn't what you get. Um, there's two things happening out there. This box um, is kind of what represents the area of mixing, um, the allow mixing zone area, kind of roughly. Uh, and then you can see this this plume, this black plume. And what we what we hear from the department um, and, and what's been responded to us is that this plume does not represent the mixing zone. It doesn't represent the effluent. So what you see ain't what you get kind of thing. And that's really hard for us to accept. That's hard for the public to uh, accept, particularly when they see this moving into the um, into the mixing zone uh, or into the, the, the search zone. Uh, and then finally, um, landfill leachate was part of the historical waste stream um, that uh, has been addressed in the reissue. Um, for folks that don't know, leachate is essentially um, sort of uh, the, the water um, spoils, if you will, of a, of a landfill. Um, and, and at the time, those were being processed um, uh, on DEQ's authority uh, by GP and incorporated into their waste stream. Um, they were treating that along with the rest of the So in 2009 is when we got the response um, to the reconsideration of the permit. And this came after we had furnished a report um, to try and help the DEQ um, uh, move forward. So this was two and a half years later. Um, the comprehensive survey was the first major change. We saw two major changes really in the permit. Um, there were conditions and what we call Schedule D conditions. Um, one was that the permittee shall conduct a comprehensive survey of the aquatic community in the area of the outfall. So this comprehensive survey we felt like was a good start, but this is really vague language. Like, what does that mean? What does a comprehensive survey exactly mean? What are we going to be measuring, and how often are we going to be doing this? It, it was very um, vague in the permit, and, and so it took some subsequent meetings with the department and with Georgia Pacific to try and really understand um, how we're going to move forward on this, this vague language. Um, and I think as we move uh, through the process in 20, this, this year, uh, this, this survey process, I think that it's going to be really important to be very transparent with how the data is collected um, and what kinds of data is being collected and how the survey um, is being implemented to ultimately get the public's buy-in um, and to, to help hopefully quell some concerns um, on that end. Um, still, we feel like um, minimally you should do this pretty often, not once every 25 years. I wouldn't go to the doctor once every 25 years. We wouldn't expect to go check out the ocean every once every 25 years and make some uh, assumptions about that. Uh, so we would like to see this type of survey happen pretty often. Um, the second thing that was addressed in the permit uh, reissue in 2009 was uh, that waste treated by the facility are limited to those on the cover page of the permit itself, which excluded leaching. Basically said, you can't treat except waste streams um, anymore from another facility and, and, and treat those. And, and I will say to Georgia Pacific's credit that they, they did not go out seeking that opportunity. In fact, it was the department um, that made that suggestion to Georgia Pacific. Um, and, and for some time, actually, Georgia Pacific was able to profit off of that um, up to, up to $800,000 uh, at times for accepting the shape from Marion County's landfills. 